All right, thank you. I'll start with myself. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes back in 1999. That means that my body no longer produces the insulin hormone, rather I must inject it with this kind of an external device. If I don't get any insulin, I'll be in coma in 24 hours. And if I inject too much insulin, I might drop dead in just a few moments. In order to know how much insulin my body requires in each situation, I must constantly track my blood glucose, pay attention to everything I eat and drink, calculate the carbohydrates there, estimate my physical activity, changes and weight, and a bunch of other parameters. If I, for instance, go running, my blood glucose usually goes down because activity enforces the activity of insulin. Whereas if I play football on a seventh division, so really low, but still with the full spirit, my blood glucose goes up because there's more testosterone and adrenaline involved. And public speaking also, there's some stress hormones usually sends my blood glucose way up unless I compensate with some additional insulin. And this is type 1 diabetes. You need to track many parameters and you need to learn from that data. Today we've got a bunch of trackers. So the tracking is easy. We've got devices, we've got apps on our mobile phones and what have you. I've got an aura ring and a tracker here. So tracking is getting easier, but learning from the data is still a challenge. And that's where Sensotrend helps. We integrate data from dozens of medical devices like glucose meters, continuous glucose monitors, insulin pumps, smart insulin pens, with data from wellness trackers like these. And we visualize the data in a way that's meaningful for treatment of type 1 diabetes and facilitate sharing it with healthcare professionals and peers. And now we thought that it might be really nice to integrate our solution with the national healthcare system. Because we've got this brand new system called Kanta PHR. We have, for over a decade, have Kanta. And that is the national health archive for clinical data. So everything that gets measured from you in hospital setting gets stored in Kanta and then it's shareable between all healthcare organizations and you can take a look yourself in a portal and see that, okay, this, this is the data that was tracked of me. Now, next to that official clinical data Kanta, there's a new system coming up and that's the personal health record system. And that is meant for all the data that we citizens ourselves track. So my blood glucose data and my insulin data, but also my daily steps, my football activity, my meal logging app, whatever these apps and devices produce. And we started the integration with that platform in 2016. It was originally introduced in 2015, and I'll share some of our learnings from that project. So build the API and they will come. That was the expectation then. So we've done plenty of integrations with Google Fit, Apple Health, and all these devices. So we basically know what to expect from an API when we start working with one. And one thing that I first always look is the documentation. I've heard about an API, so I need to know some more. I need to see that there's public documentation available that I can see, okay, what is the API about? How is it explained? Is it easy to grasp? So on. And that's taken care of quite beautifully with Kanta PHR. They've got incredible amount of information, really detailed, not too many mistakes. Things usually work exactly as they have been documented. So great. Props on that. Small complaint is that they have some PDF documents linked from the web pages, which makes search a bit difficult, but not a big complaint. So well-documented API, really good. 
The second one is, is it based on standards? And this is a crucial point for us, because whenever we build an integration, we consider that an investment. And if it's a really proprietary API, we make that investment once, and it gives us that return once. But if we make a standard implementation, we may make that in investment once and then gain multiple returns when we use the same implementation across multiple different platforms that we integrate with. So the Kanta PHR is based on HL7 Fire specification that's really hip in healthcare organization nowadays. It's JSON over REST over JSON and OpenID Connect, everything that you'd expect, really modern stuff. You can even use GraphQL with HL7 Fire or so. Also, in that sense, really good to integrate with. And that's really good for us in Finland. If we can start with the Kanta PHR, then we've got Apotti, that's a major epic installation in the metropolitan area. And that is Epic and Cerner are two of the biggest EHR, so electronic health record system vendors globally. And they all use the same specification. So we make our integration once, and after that, the world is open. Epic and Cerner are both opening up their app stores, which means that we can publish our services the same way as people publish apps in mobile app stores. So this is for healthcare apps, and we can develop our app once, and after that, Epic and Cerner sell it globally, and they take a cut when customers take it into use, and really good model for us. We like that. So, again, thumbs up for the standards part in Kanta PHR. Some thumbs down. So, in practice, even there is this international standard. Some of the implementations currently in Kanta PHR are domestic, so they have chosen to use proprietary encodings. So, the basic structure is following the international standard, but since there have been no suitable international codings for some parameters, then we've come up with our own versions, and there's no clear path to get those qualified as international standards. So, might be better, but still really good. And they have really strict profiles, and those also limit our internationalization ambitions a bit, because we need to do some things for this Finnish strict controlled environment and then do the things a bit differently when we go global, but still tolerable. And one thing yet is that the implementation is really minimal. So they have chosen to start with absolute minimum set of features and then whenever we want to have a new feature, we need to explicitly ask for that, and then they'll implement it or turn it on on their readily made platform, and then they'll write tests and so on. So that takes the... That's good that they know why each feature is there, but it slows the development down somewhat. The next thing that we look for is whether there's a sandbox environment. So it's really good to have a sandbox environment. It's good for the provider. They don't need to give us explicit access to some, some testing environment. Rather, have an open environment where we self-register, test our stuff out, and when it's good enough for us, then we go to the actual integration. And that they indeed do have, and it's based on the reference implementation of this HL7 Fire specification. So again, really good stuff. We know that what we are doing will be compatible with, the, with all the other implementations. And as said, it's essential to have a sandbox environment because that scales really well. And we even have multiple levels so one where you can just play out with the data, no need to authenticate, and so on. 
And then once you're ready to implement OpenID Connect to that, you can add authentication and check that everything still works. And then you have special environment for testing, the acceptance testing and then the production. So you've got multiple levels of environments. And all of that is free to use and no bureaucratic process. You just sign in and start developing. Again, really good stuff. Occasionally we get some cryptic error messages that don't help us with development. And then in this environment you need to create profiles for the data that you store. So if you store that just run regular data that other applications have been storing before you, okay. But if you're storing some kind of new data that doesn't have a profile on the sandbox yet, you need to generate that profile and that might be a bit difficult. The next step after that is you need a community. So even if you have the documentation and you have the sandbox where you can try stuff out, you run into problems. Something doesn't work as you expected and then it's good to have somebody to ask, okay, what's going on, what I'm not doing right, what I'm not understanding, can you please help me? And there are several versions of community in this process. There used to be a Jira openly available. It's not present anymore, but we have these kind of Skype calls, again, open to anybody to register and join. Each month lasting for two and a half hours where we discuss the development and the profiling and so on. And we've got this kind of chat forum Zulip, it's kind of slack but worse, but still widely available for this kind of projects. And what's even better is that we just have a channel on the global platform where all people interested in HL7 Fire are discussing anyway. So it's easy to tag the international experts to discussions and ask, okay, what do you think about this? Of course, much of the discussion in Finnish channel is in Finnish, but we are flexible and change to English when required. So, once again, big thumbs up. There are sandboxes, many different levels. There is this community and it is connected to the international community and there are multiple modes. There are these face-to-face -face or Skype connection com discussions and then these forums. And the thumbs down part, the clock speed is a bit low. It used to be even worse with, before we had this channel. Then it was the two and a half hours once a month. And then when you needed to wait for a change to happen for one, one month, that was really annoying. It's still not as speedy as it could be. So it seems that the official part takes a look at the forum weekly because we seem to get answers to questions always on the same weekday. But anyway, once a week is much better than once a month. And the size of the community in Finland is still quite limited, but I welcome you all to jump on board and again, thumbs up. Then we move already to kind of advanced features of APIs. So how is the API evolving? who demands what features are included and what are not included and how is that discussion going on. And of course, ideally it would be always me who decides, okay, I like this feature, but this feature is not important. But there are these democratic procedures as well. In here, I would say that it's really good approach what the Kanta PHR have chosen. So. It is a really open community. Everybody can propose changes and we discuss the changes openly, but everything is not done. Every decision is not done by democratic votes. So they are still kind of Kela, the maintainer and social and health ministry are the driving forces and they have veto right and they know where to lead this platform. So we don't get stuck in infinite yes or no questions. We do have that power to say that, no, this disc discussion ends here and this is the route that we will choose. 
So again, good. Everybody can participate and it's an open, well-defined process for gathering requirements, but still we don't get stuck with discussions for too long because everybody is not involved in making decisions. And thumbs down part, some decisions tend to stay forever hidden in some upper level of decision making process. So we, we are still waiting for some changes or answers to questions that we proposed a year back. Can we please get this? Well, we'll discuss this and we'll come back. So not always optimal, but I still think it's overall thumbs up stuff. And then we come to the final point, which, which is the incentives. So who makes money out of this and how, and how does this support your business activities? And we see that for any apps using the data from this kind of a shared repository, it's a clear yes. Of course, we want to get the data from one place. It's similar to accessing, for instance, Google Health or Apple, Google Fit or Apple Health, but for those you always need these two platforms and there's promise that Kanta PHR could be just one platform that you integrate with and you get all the data. However, there is no incentive for apps writing the data to Kanta PHR. And if all of, all of us app vendors think of data as the new gold or the new oil or just the new black. What is our motivation to write anything to that platform? And if we want some, find some motivation to write something there to pass, for instance, some regulation or to be connected with healthcare by just saying that, yes, we are integrated with this national platform then what's our motivation to write good quality data and plenty of that on the platform? Many companies think that no, we would like rather keep that, plat that data to ourselves and if somebody makes business out of the data, it will be us. And if somebody else makes business with that data, we'd rather have a contract with that other party. And there are no APIs in Conta PHR for allowing this. So when, if you're an application vendor, you just write data there. If somebody else takes it from there, it's based on the citizen's consent and permission, and you don't get any channel between these apps, the one that's writing the data and one that's reading the data. So even if the app, another app that would do really good business out of the data would like to pay for that data, would like to pay for those companies that write high quality, good data to the platform. There's no enabler for that. And that's a big no-no. So the people that are driving this are saying that yes, the incentives should be that you get your app integrated with the healthcare. Okay, you can get it through this way, but you can get it through other mechanisms as well. And then there's this beautiful Kanta brand because every Finnish citizen has some data in the Kanta system. So, of course, it's a great brand. And they do have plenty of usage, especially from the elderly people. They go check their data that it's correctly entered there and even make corrections if it's not. And in Finland, we've got high trust in government. I doubt that this same model would fly in anywhere in Europe. In fact, there are many PHR initiatives in European countries, but it's always a distributed system. There might be a commonly shared API where you access all of these PHRs, but having the government control all your private data, many other countries consider that a bit dangerous. In Finland, no. We trust our government and our officials. It's fine to have all our data there. So, well-defined business models would be really good to have in all the APIs. And here we don't have them. So that concludes all the different parts. We, I think we got five really good thumbs up and one thumb down and drum roll. 
that's the final verdict. So I would really like to see that it's the business model that really kills this beautiful API that's technically so well developed. However, personally, I'm still wondering because we won a design competition and we get some money out of building this integration to the platform. That keeps us tied to the platform as well as the international promise. So we know that doing this will help us going abroad and we like that it's using this modern technology and we get experience from that. But still, do think of the business models and make it easier for apps that write data to there to monetize their model somehow. That's it. I open it to discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great project.